We're on air. Yeah, I was, uh, I was listening to your interview with Alfie... Alfie Moore. Alfie Moore. And, what I mean, a top bloke. Yeah, what a top bloke. But to your point about the, doing the podcast on, on Zoom or online, you know, they're so good at engineering... Like, the, like Zoom, because I do on Zoom when I can. Yeah, yeah. It's so good at engineering the audio live. Oh, it's brilliant. But you don't need all this kit. I but, um, no, I, uh, I, do, I do very little editing <coughs> afterwards. I use I tweak it a little bit on GarageBand and put in the noise gate and stuff like that. But generally, I, I let it flow literally from the minute the person clicks. You know what I mean? And sometimes I think that can be some of the funniest bits when they, they don't realize they've been recorded. And I think that's illegal. <laughs> under under saying some the <laughs> saying some funny stuff. <laughs> Occasionally, people have said something really outrageous, not realizing I'm recording. And then I thought, shit, I better oh, yeah. better take that out. Better yeah, take yeah, that yeah. out. You know. uh, welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, good to be back. What is uh, I, right? So you came in February 2020, nearly a year ago. Yeah, and you came to the studio for the first time. <sighs> I know. Since then, the world, the policing world, has changed drastically. No, oh, mate. Cressida Dick. <clears throat> is it that you say your first name? Cressida? Cressida, yeah. Okay, Cressida Dick resigned in April 2022. Mm -hmm. And then we've had at least one drama where high profile uh, crime, not high profile crime, a hideous crime committed mm. by a, a, an officer. So the most, this latest one was David Carrick. I'm sure That's there's it. another. Oh, another. There's, been, there's been loads. There's been loads. It's just, it's been like a horrible, never ending nightmare. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And then on the on the local level, I mean local to this podcast level, we had um, I had uh, Neil Woods in recently talking about drug policy reform, and that has definitely <coughs> set the cat amongst the pigeons as well, among the podcast fans, and then also people who who've listened to it out of the blue. And uh, yeah. yeah, well, I think that's probably why I'm here, isn't it? Because I I oh, definitely I texted you, didn't I? I listened to that. I texted you, and I I very strongly disagree with quite a lot of the stuff that he was saying, and I just said. And you said, come back and let's have a chat about it. So here I am. Yeah, and I'll be honest, you were not the only person to do X, <laughs> uh, police officer to, to text me, <laughs> to text me with uh, uh, with words of, uh, with, well, you're, you're so strong, words, think, yours are measured. I think, used, I think I used the word complete bollocks somewhere in, the, <laughs> in that text. Um, right, let's, let's take it back a bit. So what happened with Chris and a dick? Because as, as I recall, right, she was quite well regarded amongst the Met officers. Would that be fair to say? Very well regarded, yeah. She um, she has her detractors. Um, you know, some saw her as being... It, I think it's a really good example of how you can, in policing, you can never, ever keep everyone happy. There are some who would say that she was far too political, but I would say, well, you know... The, na the nature of the job makes it uber political. Some would say that she was uh, not hard enough on her own organisation, that she had sort of, you know, she was too protective of it. Um, you know, so, but the, the story really was that um, she was caught in the middle of that whole nightmare period for policing where particularly the Met, I think it's important to point out that a lot of these issues are seem to be Met issues. I don't think, I'm not feeling that they are typical of policing across the board. But she was caught up in that whole horrible period when just everything seemed to be going wrong and we'd come off the back of COVID and the Met were, you know what I mean? It's the London, it's the London microscope that policing is permanently under. Um, Sadiq Khan clearly, uh, you know, was trying to um, appeal, I think, to his base. In other words, the people who who would be very sceptical of policing generally. Uh, clearly, their relationship had, had really fallen off the edge of a cliff. Um, I think he then turned around and said, you've no longer got my confidence. Um, and she felt that she had no alternative other than to resign. Um, they then did a review into that whole, it's a bit boring, but they went into did a legal review into all of that. And I think the, the, the inspector of constabulary, Tom Windsor, uh, made a report to say that the mayor had not followed due process, that it potentially could have been unlawful. It was effectively like an unfair dismissal or whatever. Um, but anyway, I think that's water under the bridge now. And then Mark Riley has come in as the new commissioner i think he started about 
about six months ago, something like that. How's it going with him? Uh, again, like every commissioner in history, he, he has got his supporters and he's got his sort of detractors. Personally, I think he's brilliant. Um, I think he's an uh, unbelievably capable, competent um, police officer. Hugely respected nationally in terms of his some of the jobs he's done over the years, particularly around counterterrorism. Um, he had left policing um, and gone off to do other things in the private sector. Um, so he'd been away for about three years. So um, massive respect to him for throwing his hat in the ring to come back again. So he's, he's started out. He's made it very, very clear what he what he wants to do. He wants to challenge and you know get on top of what appears to be a significant problem of um, bad behaviour. Um, not not amongst everyone. I think it's really important to make that point. I think it's it's a it's a small but significant minority, hardcore minority of officers who are clearly not behaving themselves in the way that we would want. Um, but he, he seems to be managing to walk that tightrope between saying, I'm going to get these people out of the organisation, I'm going to be ruthless about doing that, and at the same time supporting the vast majority of police officers who are there for all the right reasons and who are doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. so before, before we come on to the, uh, David Carrick, question on, in, on uh, police officer, what's the word, conduct, mm. relating to TikTok videos in uniform. What do you think about that? No, or I'm Instagram not, videos? I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. I mean, I th it's tricky. Police officers are not robots, you know, uh, they're human beings. And um, I think back in the back in the day, you know, I'm talking maybe 20 years ago, you would have the PC dancing with their arm round revelers at the Notting Hill Carnival or something like that, you know, and you'd have a member of the public wearing their helmet and stuff like that. And I think that kind of stuff is absolutely fine. Done it myself, you know. Um, you know, New Year's Eve, Trafalgar Square, everybody's trying to snog you, you know. Half the blokes are trying to snog you, you know what I mean? It's it's just a bit of fun, isn't it? But for me, what, what undermines our credibility and reputation is when you have people um, doing something and I'm thinking about the dancing, let's let's get straight to the point, dancing at a Pride Festival and all this, Macarena and all this nonsense, that to me is stepping over a line that makes you look stupid as an organisation. It, it, um, the people doing it would argue that we're just having fun and we're engaging with, we're finding ways to find common ground with people in a fun way. M my view is that um, by doing that, you are potentially uh, showing yourself to be acting in a more favorable way towards one particular section of the community. I think police officers, a good police officer in my view, and I think most of my colleagues would probably agree with me, is someone who should be uh, ruthlessly fair and balanced towards everyone. And I think to be, I mean, the worst example of what I'm describing was a, a, a silly WPC female police officer. I don't, you know, I don't think you're even allowed to call them WPC. Allowed to call them WPCs anymore. A female police officer at an anti-Israeli um, demonstration, shouting. Um, you know, I can't remember, but it was like uh, pro-Palestinian. Oh. Um, slogans and hugging, hugging demonstrators at this anti-Israeli um, demonstration, I think was outside the Israeli embassy in London. Absolutely appalling. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you agree or whether you don't agree with the, the, the rights and the wrongs of the Middle East, you know, process. Or the you know I mean do, do, do I think the Palestinians have been given a bit of a shit deal over the years? Yeah, I do actually. But when I'm on duty in uniform, then that is just not what people want to see, is it? So I think I think 
Um, all of this sort of dancing at pride, I think it's embarrassing. Um, I, I, I would be giving, dishing, if I was on duty as a senior officer in that scenario, I would be <coughs> dishing out major bollockings to people for doing that. Well, yeah, so I, I'm totally on board with you there. Like I, I would class myself as more pro-Palestinian than Israeli, for sure. I, mm. I, oh, mate, for, for, for that officer, that can, that PC to do that, crazy. And any of those situations. When I see the TikTok videos, which whether it's pride, whether it's flipping, what, whatever it's linked to, when I see the TikTok videos or the Instagram videos of it, an officer in uniform doing it, the first thing that pops into my mind is, what's the motivation? Mm. And I can guarantee you, they haven't been asked to do that mm. by the PR, whatever the PR team is in, in, in whatever constabulary they're in. They haven't mm. been asked to do that. Mm. They're doing it because they want to get attention for themselves yeah. on social media. That yeah. is all they're doing it for. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yes, it's really good for people who are associated with that that initiative, that, um, you know, that, in, in, let's say pride, people who see pride, and they may like seeing it, but in general, yeah. to your point, I agree with you. I think it has a detrimental impact on people's overall perception of the police. Mm. At a time, we really don't need it. No. We, they don't really don't need no, it, you know, no. really difficult. Okay, it's interesting. The, the problem is, you see, if you, if you, if you, if you speak out against that, with, when you're in the police, internally <laughs> within the police, if you speak out against that, you're immediately labelled as being some sort of homophobe, uh, which is not the case at all. And, you know, I, I, the thing that used to get up my nose when I was a serving, um, you know, senior officer was this, obsession with certain people wearing these rainbow lanyards um, uh, to carry their IDs uh, to show solidarity with LGBTQ, whatever it is, plus whatever. Um, I, refuse to, I refuse to wear them, not, not in any way because I'm remotely homophobic. I don't actually give a shit what, what someone, who someone you know, wants to go to bed with or who's attracted to I'm not remotely interested I don't care good luck to you but what I won't do is be bullied into wearing some sort of tokenistic um, thing that shows me being in solidarity with I'm in, I I think we should be as police officers or as human beings for that matter I think we should be in solidarity with everyone I think we should be treating everyone you know, with respect and courtesy and, you know, respect, respecting whatever they believe, however they choose to live their life, as long as it's not against the law and it's not harming anybody else, then crack on as far as I'm concerned. But what I won't do is, is, is have someone say to me, you should be wearing that because if you're not wearing that, you're not, you know, a true believer, you know? Yeah, it's bullshit, isn't it? Bullshit, it's uh, othering people. Hmm. What I do, and you're you're an outcast if you don't overtly show your support for something. But yeah. you know, to your point, it's like people. The reality is, is that people make uh, people make judgments of other people all the time based on, in the first instance, based on visual what they see visually, yeah. right? And so, I mean, uh, and so um, <coughs> if you've got a a pride flag or a pride pin badge or something like that as an example, people are gonna see that and some people will make an active judgment about you either mm. positively or mm. negatively they will yeah, yeah. whereas if you haven't got it they will make the judgment it's not even on the radar mm. so why and and i want people to treat me fairly regardless of what i believe in or what i or mm. what i support you know um yeah okay no i'm glad i was interested to hear your perspective on that because i i it's, it's hard to work out it's well well it's hard to work out what what you think is right and what mm. is not especially when you're not a police officer in that situation mm. And uh, and two, it's hard to talk about it in yeah. a way that's well, not going to bring you drama. Well, you I'm, um, you know, as a, as a retired police officer now, I, I say what I say what I like, and you know, I'm I, I'm very br brutally honest on my podcast, you know, and um, I get people on, and it's almost impossible. And this is the test, isn't it? It's almost impossible to get serving police officers to come and talk to me on the podcast. Um, because they're just too scared. They're too scared, and uh, they'll talk to me, you know, off offline, and they'll tell me what they think. But that's that's a measure of. I mean, don't get me wrong. Would I have gone onto a podcast as a serving officer and said what I actually think? <sighs> Fuck that! No way! <laughs> no way! Yeah. You know, it, it would just be absolutely disastrous <laughs> career-wise. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas now, I just think now. I'm 
I think exactly the same today as I did when I was serving. The difference is I'm free to say it now. Yeah, interesting. Um, right. How on earth does someone like David Carrick over so long a period of time get to get away with what he did? And, and going back, how did he end up getting into the first place? Because there was some red flag beforehand, right? Yeah, well, the whole thing's just a bloody disaster. And I'm, I, I, th I think the simple answer to that question is I don't know, but I can, I can guess. Um, so you're talking about someone who's been in the organization for a long time. And, and that, that, I think that fact is the single most shocking thing for me about the David Carrick um, scandal is that this is not someone who has been rushed into the organization in order to fulfill a recruitment quota in the last two years and we haven't done our due diligence properly on them or their vetting has there's been a problem with the vetting whatever this is someone who's been in the organization for 20 years who <clears throat> will have been through um, numerous um, refreshes of his vetting during that period of time um, and where you know the full facts haven't will come out on no, of no doubt in terms of a, of a full review of all of this but on the face of it there appears to have been about nine opportunities um, to identify um, his clearly abusive attitude and actions and behavior towards women uh, multiple women in his um, private life and I find it incredibly hard to imagine that some of that behavior will will not have been expressed at work as well so I'm really struggling to understand what on earth has been going on there what what, are those, what do those nine opportunities look like generally what kind of things are we talking about I think the, t the typical theme seems to be um, <laughs> allegations from partners about um, domestic abuse about um, I, I believe this I'm not. I'm going to be careful what I say because well, no, it's a. It's a it, he's he's been convicted, hasn't he? So there's no subjudice issues there. Um, uh, I believe there's sexual misconduct towards ex-partners. Um, and these are reported to police during his time. These, these are these have been reported to, I believe, numerous different forces. Um, so he's obviously moved around a bit. I believe it was Hertfordshire Police who did the final, full investigation that resulted in his convictions for all of those offences, but. I, I, my understanding is that there was numerous offences um, alleged against him over the years from different places at different times. What happens with allegations on someone's record? <clears throat> As in, I'm talking about criminal record here. So, would he have a, so what does this look like in terms of, if someone makes an allegation against him, mm -hmm. um, let's say it's not followed through to a conviction, mm. what does that look like in terms of historical record that can be researched by the okay. force? Okay, so um, every time someone is arrested or any... In, Ideal world. Ideal world is um, every time someone comes to the notice of police, um, an electronic record will be created um, in, a, in either a command and control system or in a intelligence system. All of those records um, should then be uploaded to what's known as the Police National Database, PND, which is a national database um, containing um, allegation, uh, all intelligence, allegations of crime. Um, anytime someone comes to the notice of the criminal justice system, so so theoretically, all of those issues, historic issues in respect of him, should have been recorded um, on police systems and should have found their way onto the police national database. Clearly. Um, whether that is not whether those incidents have not been recorded or put into the intelligence system i and furthermore because he's a serving police officer you would expect a referral immediately to be made by so say for example he does something in warwickshire where we are at the moment and um warwickshire police investigate it and go oh he's a serving police officer i think we better tell the met about that so they would they should make a referral into probably the Met Professional Standards Department to say one of your officers came to our attention on such and such a date at, at address, blah, blah, blah. Um, victim doesn't want to cooperate with an investigation. Uh, however, we thought you should know. But 
it seems to me that all of these allegations are either haven't been recorded properly, perhaps they haven't been uploaded into the police national database, but there's been a there's been a massive, a monumental breakdown in um, intelligence sharing, I would suggest, between forces and the Met. I mean, I don't know. It's going to be, uh, this will be 100 percent. This will be the, the this will be the subject either of a specific inquiry into this case or a wider inquiry into police bad behavior generally. Um, but I can only really guess as to why this I, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of conspiracies. Um, there'll be people out there saying, oh, he was protected. Oh, he's, he obviously had the, the the black on someone. He had a little red book of, you know, all the, there'll be all these wild conspiracies about David Carrick. I, I don't believe in conspiracies. <coughs> I, I much prefer the, the fuck up theory rather than a conspiracy. I think there's just been a monumental fuck up here. Is there, does, is there a culture that sometimes pervades or on individuals or on... Um not individuals, like sub, 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 so yeah, so subcultures within the constabulary or not, where if an allegation, like especially on sexual misconduct or something like that, an allegation comes from a, a partner, um, short or long-term partner, towards a police officer, is there, and it's, maybe it's not clearly, it's not clear that it was a crime, is there sometimes a, um, a situation where the officer receiving the report or investigating will err on the side of, oh, it's more than likely to be bullshit because he, he he's been Carrick's been targeted because he's a police officer as an ex I'm not just specific to Carrick as an example and then there's a reluctance to do the proper chain of reporting and handling of that case because of that fact so it well, doesn't go on the PM. <clears throat> I would say I would say no and okay. that's a, and that's another reason why I'm really struggling with this to try and understand what's going on because in my experience <clears throat> and the experience of most cops is that if anything it's the opposite. If, if anything, when a police officer comes to notice of another police force somewhere else, or even their own police force, th they tend to get treated much more harshly than a member of the public. Um, oh, really? So, again, that, that really, it really, I really struggle to see, you know, how he seems to have effectively gotten away with it for so long. That surprises me. Why? Why you treat it so much harsher instead of a fair? Because uh, maybe, maybe I need to add a bit more sort of historical context to that. If we were sat here thirty years ago, I would say, yeah, they've probably, they've probably, as we would have said in the old in the old days, they've probably squared it up. They've probably. You know, given that police officer, maybe a bit drink drive was the classic one. You know, years and years ago, a police officer would get stopped off duty for drink drive and they would get their warrant card out and show the officers the warrant card. And <coughs> half the time, they probably would have gotten away with it. The other half of the time, they would have been arrested as they should have been. Today, I don't think that's the case at all. I think I think there is a culture of um wanting to be seen to be squeaky clean in the police um and with the presence of mobile phones uh, cctv dash cams it's absolutely and body worn video is another one for police officers there's an absolutely no way that they can get away with you know helping someone out mm. in the way that might have happened 30 years ago um so Again, that to me makes the whole thing even more um, unbelievable. Really, I just I just don't understand how he's got away with it for as long as he has. So, if it's not conspiracy theory and he's protected for up on high or whatever, and he hasn't got a hold of someone because of whatever, then it then it's a, a coincidence of several severe fuck ups and several forces. I think so. I think obviously we'll wait and see what what a review has to say, but I think you will find, I think I if I had a crystal ball, I think you will find that there will have been multiple screw ups, um, along the way, but one of the one of the points that 
no one n n no one seems to be making about all of this and i i've made this point um you know on my podcast and and then various articles i've written is that if you look at where policing is today in 2023 versus where policing was in 2010 and i don't want to rehearse all of the things we talked about in the first podcast Policing had its legs taken away in 2010 under Theresa May and David Cameron, lo losing huge 30% of its budget, 50% of the police stations in, in England and Wales closed and sold off, 75% of police stations closed and sold off in London. As well as losing 20,000 police officers, we also lost 23,000 members of police staff, civilian members of staff. Now, it would have been those civilian members of staff who would have done a lot of this kind of work behind the scenes maintaining databases um uh, doing vetting checks i mean they do all sorts of things everything from you know call handling and uh, intelligence working in intelligence departments working in forensics units and all sorts of stuff okay but one of the things that no one seems to be saying about all of this is well if, if we're saying we didn't join the dots about David Carrick over that long period of time, well, why, why was that? And I would say a big part of that was because the people who should have been, who would normally, previous to 2010, who would have been doing all of those checks and maintaining systems and making sure data got uploaded to national databases, but they, were all, they all lost their jobs after 2010. So lots and lots of things that should have been done in policing post 2010 just were not being done. And I think that's probably a significant part of it. <coughs> what about, um, is it possible that he could have, that he would become aware early on of these different allegations over different times and be able to personally influence the actions or opinions of the investigating officer? Hey, this woman's no, always he, done it to me before. She's talking shit. Just, uh, I, yeah. I think it's more a case rather than trying to influence the investigating officer. I think it's more likely that he's been just bullying um, victims, bullying his partners along the way. He'll be ter He'll be putting them into um, fear to um, make them understand that if if they carry, if they pursue this, he's going to harm them really badly. Or, you know, it could be a more subtle sort of control, that sort of coercive control. Um, do I see, I mean, again, we'll have to see what any review comes up with. Do I see him actually putting pressure on an investigating officer? Mm, probably not. Probably so, not. So most of the allegations then were put in and then they, but they didn't want to take, they didn't want to press charges or take it forward after mm. a period of time. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Pretty, pretty, pretty much all of them, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, well, that sounds obvious, doesn't it? Yeah, he's, he's, pressuring, the, he's pressuring the victims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, I didn't realize that bit. I haven't, I haven't read in detail on it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, hmm. some of those, again, I don't know, you know, I don't know in, in granular detail what, sh what each of those investigations looked like or what the nature of the allegations was. But I think the general theme was <clears throat> ab abusive relationships, whether it's physically or sexually or emotionally and psychologically, a combination of all of those. And a lot of those investigations do tend to go nowhere, even forget the fact he's a police officer. You know, I ran a department for, you know, several years uh, looking at exactly this type of behavior. And it is very hard to get to get the cooperation of victims of this type of this type of behavior. Very often there is insufficient evidence or, you know, these are offenses that are very often taking place behind closed doors. The only there's only two people there. Um, it's always going to be one person's word against another. And in the absence of sort of very obvious physical injuries or other corroborating evidence, such as, say, lots of social media messaging or whatever, you know, abusive messaging, <coughs> if it's if it's, it's it is difficult. And then and then as well as it being difficult to gather the evidence with these jobs, there's also um, the dynamics, the relationship dynamics between those two people, you know, very often people like David Carrick will will effectively groom and have relationships with women who are very vulnerable, emotionally very vulnerable, um, who've got very low expectations of a relationship. 
and, and are probably more tolerant of bad behavior than, you know, many other women, you know, so it's really complicated. So, but do I, do I think there's been a big conspiracy? Do I think that police officers investigating those have been letting him off? No, I don't, probably not. I think, it, I think he's just a very devious, manipulative bully. Um, and then you combine that with lots and lots of organizational fuck ups. Mm. Apart from that, <laughs> on that cheer, cheerful note. Apart from that, <laughs> what do you think in general the uh, state of policing is at the minute to what it was the last time we spoke? And I mean, we you know you got the Met specific, but also you got UK wide in general. Yeah, I think you you need to sort of you need to kind of like separate. I I think the Met compared to policing in England and Wales. I think, I think policing in England and Wales has definitely deteriorated, even in that 12-month period. I kind of said that that would happen. Um, I think things will probably get worse still before they get better. Um, so I think the last time we spoke, um, the positive outcomes for total recorded crime, uh, in other words, someone gets charged or or cautioned for an offence, or offence gets uh, reported to police, gets investigated, a positive outcome will be a charge or a caution. When I think when we spoke last time, that number was about just over 7%, I think it was 7.1% of total recorded crime, which is appallingly bad, considering that 20 odd years ago it was about 20%. Um, it's now dropped to 5.4%. So so in terms of, in terms of the the quality of crime investigations and the positive outcomes for those investigations, it's gone, it's continuing to go downhill. In terms of morale, uh, morale uh, is in a, in a absolutely terrible place for policing in England and Wales. Um, huge numbers of police officers resigning. Um, there was a time uh, and I talked about this with Alfie Moore on the podcast, you know, when someone left the police, you would talk about it for the next six months amongst your colleagues. It was just, people just didn't do it. People were in the organization for, for their full working life. They would see 30 years, pretty much everyone I know in policing that I joined with around Center, we all did our 30 years. That was, it was never even a question about whether you would leave. The only people who left would either get sacked uh, or they would, you know, there was always a small number of people who would maybe go off and do something else. But generally speaking, everybody stayed. <coughs> now people are resigning in their droves. Um, many of them are leaving before they've even done their two years initial training. And thousands are leaving mid-service um, for, for, for all the reasons that, you know, I talked about in my book about really it's just become a really really thankless job mm. i mean there is another there is another reason that <clears throat> people will not be staying the full the full length of career that's not spe just specific to police mm. is that in like society these days see they and employers play play must much less value on someone who's spent 15 years in a job it's like it, ch job changing is much more accepted now yes it is i totally agree but in policing, the re another big reason why a lot of people are leaving is, is it's a combination of things. It's never just one thing. I think there is, there is uh, the, the pay has fallen behind um, lots of other occupations. When I joined, the pay was very good. Actually, I was earning, I was earning a lot more. That I, you know, I was I was a graduate when I joined. It was quite rare in those days, but uh, the pay was a lot better than most of my colleague, my friends who were, had been at university with. The pay was very good. Oh, okay. uh, the pay is not good now. Um, so there's, the pay has fallen behind, so people are looking to leave to, to you know, the cost of living crisis and all of that kind of stuff. Um, morale generally, leadership is cited, the poor leadership, poor weak leadership is cited as a key reason for people leaving, just fed up with it. Um, uh, completely impossible demand at the front end of policing. Like the demand has just gone up and up and up in terms of, um, all of the things that police officers are now expected to try and do, particularly around mental health. 40% 40 of police time is now spent dealing with mental health issues. Um, again, come back to that, because 
a lot of the resources for those services were cut in 2010 as well. So because we're a 24-7, 365 service, who else is going to deal with the person in the street who is wandering around, potentially, a, a, you know, uh, vulnerable, um, potentially uh, a risk to themselves or other members of the public at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon? It's going to be, it's going to be the police, isn't it? So there's all sorts of reasons why people are leaving. But to answer your original question, how is policing now compared to what it was 12 months ago? It's definitely worse. Hmm. Um, we were talking about just now, well, not just now, about 20 minutes ago now, I think, about people's perception of the way different parts of society are targeted or favoured or not by police. Mm. Um and when I was chatting with Neil Woods on that podcast, one of the things that I try, I really struggled to come to terms with is that his opinion that, an apparently evidence-based opinion that uh, people of colour, black people are overwhelmingly t t targeted by police in different ways mm. for different reasons, mm. consciously or not consciously, <clears throat> compared to people who are not black, not coloured. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your experience on that or opinion on that? Yeah, it's, a, it's one of those subjects that for a very, very long time has been almost impossible to talk about without um, it becoming instantly politicised and sort of weaponised. The whole subject becomes weaponised, um, particularly by people with a, you know, a a left-leaning, shall we say, political agenda. <clears throat> and um, my own experience is that uh, without, without any shadow of a doubt, without any shadow of a doubt, the police come into contact with uh, particularly young black men uh, in a disproportionate, they're disproportionately having those interactions excuse me, with young black men um, compared to young white men, particularly in certain geographies of the inner cities, particularly London, Manchester, Birmingham, places like that. Um, so are young black men more likely to be having interactions and often negative interactions with policing? Yes. Yes, they are. Um, are young black men more likely to be um, stop searched, um, arrested, charged, imprisoned than young white men of the same age? Yes, they are. But this is the point that really uh, irritates me, is that people are far too quick to make the lazy, come to the lazy conclusion that the only possible explanation for that is that police officers are racists. In my experience, you know, are there, are there individual police officers out and about who are racist? Yes, there are. <coughs> but are there individual vicars, um, primary school teachers, doctors, um, engineers who are racist yes there are the, the police are a represent the public uh, they are drawn from the public and will therefore bring in some of the attitudes unacceptable attitudes that exist within the wider public but um it probably helps i've got some stats here go for it which i'm just going to share with you just to try and paint the picture as to as to um, what we think is going on here. So, pause. Yep. Yeah. Right, the, yeah, back on. Okay, so, um, so t to il just to kind of um, illustrate my point, it's important to, to kind of give some statistics. Don't worry, I'm not gonna bombard you with, with loads and loads of statistics here, but I think it's important to kind of take, and these are, and these are government statistics. This is an Office, Office of National Statistics stats, uh, which will probably be drawn from various sources, Home Office, etc. So if you look at, if you look at uh, demographics, so 2021 demographics, okay? So if we talk about London, 
um, black people in London, people who uh, identify of black, and there's going to be various different kind of subcategories there, are 13.5% um, of the London population. Um, and uh, I would say that I'm just looking at the st stats here. So nationally for England, England and Wales, it's, it's going to be somewhere, it'll average out at about 5 to 6% probably nationally. But if you look at, so this is the disproportionality thing. If you look at um, the ethni ethnicity of adults in the criminal justice system generally, um, black people will uh, account for about 20% of stop and search. So clearly there is a disproportionate use of stop and search there. I don't think anyone will ever argue with that. Um, if you look at um, sorry, so what's the point you're making there? So let me just come on, come on to that. Okay, so yeah. I just, just, just need to point out that I am, I am in agreement with the fact that there is a element of disproportionality. Or it's not an element. Black people are disproportionately represented in stop and search, arrests, convictions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when you say that statement alone, the conclusion is jumped to. Can be jumped to that. Yeah. That is a bad thing. It's all for bad reasons, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, the 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 point I was the point I was making um, with uh, uh, you know a friend the other day was that people have lost the ability <clears throat> for critical thinking in this whole subject. So, when you come on to homicides, so this is this is Home Office statistics around homicides. Okay. Um, in London, there were, uh, let me see, between a three-year period, 2015 to 2018, okay, and this is broadly going to be reflected over the last sort of 10 years or so, but I've just used these three years just to give a bit of a, a sort of a bit of context. So between those three years, there was 377 homicides in London. 42% of those homicides, the victims were black. Um, so, so you've got a population of about 13 percent, 13 percent of the population, and they are, they make up 42 percent of homicides. Um, in so, where the, where the victim was black, where the victim was black. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of uh, methods of killing, um, and I'll read this out. This is from the Home Office. A sharp instrument was the most common method of killing for victims of all ethnic groups although the proportions vary by ethnicity. At least two-thirds, 65% for the black ethnic group, but just under one-third, 31% of white homicide victims. So, so it's knives. We're talking about knives. Knives are being used to kill predominantly young black men in the inner cities. And, and again, I'm not saying anything terribly controversial here. You will find that... The majority of those murders are also committed by by young black men against other young black men. And Professor Larry Sherman of Cambridge University, who's probably the foremost authority on everything to do with policing, uh, evidence-based policing in the UK, um, and I'll read out what he said in one of his reports. Um, when accounting for age, the disparity is starker still. For those aged 16 to 24, the 21st century average puts black people over 10 and a half times more likely than white people to be victims of homicide in England and Wales. In fact, researchers point out that per 100,000 people, the most recent data from 2018-19 puts the murder risk of young black people 24 times higher than that of young white people. So that's the end of my statistics. But just, it's really, really important to make this point that the reason very often that police officers are butting up against young, well, <coughs> predominantly young black men in certain parts of the country is because for all sorts of very complex social sociological reasons that go back a long long way here they are committing a lot more 
certain types of crime than young white men. And when I say, you know, all sorts of sociological reasons, they are, um, they suffer m much higher levels of deprivation, living in quite deprived communities, lower levels of educational attainment, lower life expect sort of expectations from life, very high levels of absent fathers, very poor role models. Um, and uh, the, the sad thing, if you look at drug dealing, one of the points that Neil Woods was making about drug dealing is that it seemed to me from listening to what he was saying that, that he was <coughs> effectively saying the only reason that black people are being arrested in the drugs trade is because the police are picking on them because of the colour of the skin. Now, the reality is, and I'll just bring that report back up again, there was a, there was a, um, there was a freedom of information request conducted um, for an article I was looking at the other day, which was interesting. And it was saying, um, nearly half of all people convicted for class A drug supply in London are black. Um, something like 42% 40, of people convicted for selling Class A drugs in the capital are black, and that's a, a proportion that rises to 50% for drug dealers aged under 21. So that, that, is a, that is a fact. Now, Neil might say, well, that's because the police are picking on them all the time. I'd say, no, 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 no. That's because the, the business model of drug dealing is that, generally speaking, people higher up the kind of food chain in, in the drugs world will, who are not getting their hands dirty um, are probably, I wouldn't say exclusively white, but they're probably going to be either white or, or Asian. Eastern, white, sort of Eastern European, a lot of Albanian drugs gangs, so that, um, <coughs> a lot of um, South Asian drugs gangs um, who, are, who are kind of bringing those drugs into the country in you know, a large scale importation of drugs. The sad reality is that an awful lot of the sort of people on the streets actually serving it up to punters on the streets are young black men. And then that then creates that horrible toxic mix uh, of violent confrontation on the streets between USGs, urban street gangs. Uh, which, with all of the, I mean, if you check out some of these drill drill videos on YouTube, you know, where they're all dis disrespecting each other, they're all masked up. It's all, it's all glamorising drugs, guns, money, women, fast cars. Um, they are easy pickings. They're easy prey f because of quick money um, for to be manipulated, I think, by the Mr. Biggs of the crime world, um, because they just, they, you know, as I said, they are... Um, More exploitable. They're, they're, they are, they are, and I, you know, but the point, the point that I just find very frustrating, because I just hear it all the time, and I, and I think that it's now become an established fact in the mind of most intelligent people uh, who should know better, who should be capable of a bit more critical thinking on this, is that m people like like my, my daughter, my eldest daughter, she's 30, she lives in London, she lives in East London, professional woman, and she'll say to me, Dad, all my friends think the police are a bunch of racists, everyone. It's become, an, it's become a fact in the mind of most members of the public now in the UK. And what I'm saying is, no, they're not. What they're having to try and navigate every single day is a situation where a lot of um, on-street visible criminal activity is being conducted by young black men for all sorts of complex reasons about deprivation. And therefore, inevitably, the police are going to be having <coughs> negative interactions with them, which will, you know, uh, if you look at stop and search, 
one of the things that people will say about stop and search is the media are very, very guilty of this. They will fixate on the positive, the conversion rate of stops to actually finding something. They'll say, oh, but only 1% of stop searches will result in police finding something. So therefore, it's a pointless tactic. It's like, no, 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 no. You're missing the point here is that it's a, it's a deterrent to, to, to people to take knives, guns, and articles used to commit crime onto the streets. Um, so the question I would like to ask the, the media commentators, the Guardian journalists say, okay, if you're saying that the police are picking on young black men, what do we do about the fact that young black men between the ages of 16 and 24 are 24 times more likely to be murdered, usually by other young black men? What would you do? Just put, just turn the question around and say, what do we do? Do we do nothing? Or do we try and stop that from happening? Because it seems to me that when you try and stop it from happening by things like Section 60, um, a sort of stop search kind of powers, Section 1, which is Section 1 PACE, Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which is like, you know, uh, stopping someone and searching them, um, you know, uh, dynamically in the course of your day-to-day -day duty. Are you saying that we stop doing that? Because I, 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 I'll tell you what, what, what will be said then if we do. What will be said, and it's already been said by people like Diane Abbott and other people, is that the police tolerate the murder of young black men. So it seems to me that... Because you're not actively investigating. Yeah, yeah. Well, you either, you either <laughs> try and stop it from happening, in which case you get accused of being racist, or you don't, in which case you get accused of tolerating the murder of young black men. So I think we've got to a situation now where people have completely lost their minds on this whole subject. And, and it's nothing new. If you go back to 1995, so I joined the police in 1989. In 1995, the Met Commissioner, um, Sir Paul Con Condon, Condon. Um, <laughs> unfortunate, unfortunate name, isn't it? So Paul Condon got himself in so much hot water because he came out and said that the majority of on-street muggings in London were being committed by young black men, which was true. <clears throat> Something like 75 or 80% of, of muggings, knife point muggings or muggings, as we know, street robbery, okay, were committed by young black men. Oh my God. What an unbelievable hoo-ha there was when he came out and said that. And, um, and, and that illustrated to me, so at, at that time I was, working, I was working in South London and uh, in a part of South London that was, you know, a lot of, um, there were a lot of young black men committing a lot of crime. During that time we were, we were arresting people for street robbery and drug dealing day in and day out. Um, but it seems to be that when someone comes out and says what's so obviously the case, but it just instantly gets politicized. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, even I even find myself even sitting here saying this, I feel myself feeling quite anxious about it because I know that there are so many people out there wanting to jump on the police and keep perpetuating this bullshit stereotype that police are all a bunch of racists and they're not. Mm. It's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, it's difficult from uh, Joe Blog's perspective to try and navigate what the information you've been presented, right? Especially for most people who don't have the opportunity to one engage in a conversation like this with mm. someone who has experience, you know, experience in policing, and two has time to go and research online and and try and and think about exactly what statistics are being presented to them, or headlines being presented to them, or situations being presented to them. You know, to your point about politicising. Media love it. Mm. Media will do it, and and politicians will do it. From you know, Labour love to do it. Other other parties love to do it, especially on the on the on the subject of, of race and all the rest of it. And there's also a, a, like a, a lack of understanding in your public because they don't need to understand. And I'm kind of myself in that as well. Is how to interpret statistics and how easy it is to spin statistics. Yeah. So they sound really fucking bad. Yeah. But actually they're not. You know, mm. they're actually not. I mean. Um, mm. 
I first, my, my, like my first, uh, my first um, sort of just sidetracking slightly, just to give a re to people who don't know what I'm trying to explain, to give an example. So you can have a headline, and we're going to go on the subject of food, right? You can have a headline that says, uh, eating this type of food will result in a 200% increase in your chance of developing heart disease later in life. 200%. That is huge, mm. right? That's a huge percentage increase. Mm. But if you were to go and drill into the statistics, you could find that the actual percent, the chance of it is 0.0001%, oh, no. right? And if you eat this type of food, it incre it doubles to 0.00002%. The headline is 200% increase, <laughs> but know. it happens, Ian. It, know, that's how they do it. It's happen it happens. I'm not I saying know. it's all done like that, but my point is, oh, man, it's so difficult. And you can't blame yeah. where, where things at the moment, people are so... Like we're so divided, but at the same mm. time, people, it's also driven by, the division is also driven by such a willingness not to want to outcast anybody, anybody to be treated differently, mm. which is where, which is why the subject of race and policing is so, it can be so divisive online. Yeah. People misinterpreting what's being said, information being misrepresented, mm. and you end up in situations like this, which I can only imagine is also it's also inhibiting the the quality of performance of certain police forces. Well, it's got to the point now where certain parts of the country, um, people, have, police officers, have just given up on stop searching anyone. Never mind black people. They don't. They just don't do it. They're too scared, you know. Whereas when I was a uniform police officer many years ago <coughs> in, in South London, we had our hands in people's pockets dozens of times every day. Because that was how you stop. You, it's not the only way that you suppress crime. There's all sorts of different tactics you use to suppress crime. But um, if 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 criminals or people who are leading a criminal lifestyle know that there's cops out there who are looking, sniffing around day in and day out, looking to catch them, and they are <coughs> not scared of stopping them and they're not scared of putting their hands in their pockets, then you will not get people as much. You'll always get it, but you're never going to get the same level of brazen disregard for the law that we're currently seeing. So a lot of these shootings that we've had recently, um, you know, these terrible shootings, there's one up in, there's one up in, um, Liverpool wasn't there. That poor girl who was shot in a pub and drive-by shooting with that, with the these fucking idiots um, uh, uh, firing shotguns into the funeral outside, um, you know, the church up in uh, was it North London. Um, there, just around the New Year period. There's been and there's lots of lots of others, lots of others. Is what we're seeing at the moment is a brazen a brazenness from criminals that w I don't think we've seen in this country before. Why? Because they are taking advantage of the vacuum that has been left by the withdrawal of policing um, or a police service that has become in increasingly fearful of, of dealing robustly with criminality because it's all just become too political and too worrying particularly for younger officers you know when i was a sergeant or an inspector you know um s some officers would s i'd say yeah let's 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 stop this car you know we'd be out in patrol and night duty or something and I'd, all right let's stop this car i don't like the look of the driver and um why would you not like the look of a driver all sorts of reasons go on um and a young and in inexperienced officer would say, oh, what reason have we got to stop the car, Sarge, or whatever? Okay, because we're police officers. That's our job. Our job is to know what criminals look like, how they behave, and, and then to make their life as difficult as we possibly can, um, either until we've put them in prison or until they've decided that this crime business is just too risky. And, you know, I, I would have, um, when I was an inspector, I remember in Birmingham, uh, a young officer saying to me, um, what reason would I 
have to go, you know, I'd say, well, you need to speak to him. Well, what, what reason have I got to, to speak to that person? I say, you're a police officer. You can speak to whoever you like, you know. Um, whereas now I think there's a real reluctance to even engage with people on the street to never mind um, search them, stopping even stopping cars now has become politicised. You've got a police officer a right to stop a car in England and Wales for you don't even have to have a reason. Really, um, a part of the Road Traffic Act is one six eight section one six eight Road Traffic Act. I think I'm probably wrong. Now. All the cops are going to be shouting at me now. But <laughs> <laughs> there is you don't actually have to have a reason to stop a car, um, and you, they don't need to be you know making a you, you have to have a reason to search the car. You might have to have a reason to you know, but. The, fact that the thing that really worries me is because of all of this stuff, the loss of resources, the cuts the austerity, under austerity, people leaving, low morale, the politicised nature of policing now has become, it's become a situation now where it's become incredibly thankless for frontline officers. And, and the only people who are benefiting from that are criminals. So... Mm. What if, because obviously there's a massive uh, amount of pressure on police at the moment, strained resources, what if we removed a load of the laws related to drugs? What if we reformed drug policy as suggested by Neil Woods? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm completely in agreement with that. Um, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, um, as far as I'm, well... You're in agreement? Well, no, I, I think... Caveat, caveat that, <laughs> caveat that. I think the war against drugs has was lost long ago. I think I think all we're doing the current the current approach to enforcing drug laws. Uh, all that's doing is lining the pockets of organised crime. It's creating untold misery on the streets. It's driving a criminal market which results in the deaths of many, many young men uh, who are, you know, affiliated to urban street gangs and who are stabbing and shooting each other. It's not helping people who are um, addicted to drugs because the, 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 the price of, the wholesale price of drugs is, it's never been cheaper than it is at the moment. Uh, so the supply is, is almost limitless the amount of drugs coming into the country is 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 unbelievable i mean there's a on my podcast the, the next the next episode which i'm going to be putting out next week is with a chap called ian brighton who is a expert witness around drugs his next police officer and is, is now probably arguably the most knowledgeable person around the drug trade in the uk and i would urge people to listen to that i don't want to plug my podcast on your podcast but um, listen to that one with Ian Brighton. It'll be a real eye opener to, to see how the drug markets were working in the UK. So, without any shadow of a doubt, the enforcement route, the the way that um, police and other law enforcement agencies, or the the entire mechanism of trying to suppress drug supply, is has failed utterly. So, as far as I'm concerned. Um, drug, the use of drugs by someone who's got an addiction should be treated as an illness um, and uh, they should be given prescri prescribed um, heroin or whatever it is that they need um, so it should, the whole thing should be medicalised it should be taken away completely from from policing in terms of you know the street kind of um, you know drug addicts a drug addict should should be seen as a, a victim, a vulnerable victim, rather than a criminal, hundred percent. But, and this is, and this is the point: if you were going to do that and do it at scale across the country, so I'm not talking about some little pilot project in some particular part of the country. I think if you're going to do this, you need to do it at scale across the country. So it would it would instantly kill off half of the county lines, um, you know, drug supplies around the UK. But, but in parallel with that, you also need to have an absolutely ruthless approach to um, the illegal side of drug supply. 
And um, the only the only slight point I would I would make about the um, drug users, the people who I definitely think we should be much harder on in terms of drug users are the so-called recreational drug users. Um, so that's your middle class people buying their cocaine for the weekend and all of this kind of stuff because the reality is whether they like to think it or not is that they are driving a horrible violent criminal enterprise that results in misery and death and it's not just about their bit of cocaine for the weekend or uh, whatever they, they need to realize that you know their behavior their behavior has consequences so um, yeah, one of the interesting things, so I was looking for a message there from a, from another former police officer who sent me through and he quite vigorously was against Neil Wood's suggestion. And I thought you were too. I was surprised that you're mm. not surprised. I'm pleasantly surprised you're in line with it because it makes sense. To, it does make sense to me what, what the, that one, whatever we're doing now isn't working. No. And two, based on, I've, I've, I've. I've heard of the I've heard of the elite in inverted commas legalizing the drug drugs uh, the, the legalizing drugs is working in other places uh, and um, like I think Portugal's one certain parts of the states is doing it but <clears throat> one of the interesting observations that Neil Woods made is that the people will say oh in your example of a heroin addict oh if you and the heroin addict go and get it for, for free well well, they just they just make it easier for them to get it. But one of the uh, one of the pieces of evidence that Neil Wood said was that they know that uh, through um, in other places this is happening, the heroin addict will go and they'll get the heroin, right? But over time, they will reduce the amount of heroin they require. They mm. they will do it themselves. Mm. They're getting less from the doctor mm. or wherever they get it from, and over time, they actually come off it completely. Yeah. And one of the main reasons for that is because the source of where they're getting the heroin from isn't trying to push more on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The source of where they're getting the heroin from is now yeah. a legal yeah. thing. As yeah. someone with their health in mind, and they're doesn't probably want them on and it. they're probably getting a range of other interventions at the same time. They're probably getting some counselling. Yeah. They're probably getting some advice about their money. They're probably <clears throat> getting all sorts of other support wrapped around that, as well as the actual, um, you know, medical, um, you know, prescription that they're that they're getting. Um, yeah, it's a business model. It's it's supply. It's it's uh, expand your market at any cost, and if that means initially giving it away, that's what drug dealers will do. They will give it away um, until people are you know addicted, and then and then they they have to start paying for it, and then they'll and, oh, and by the way, you also owe me um, you know five hundred pounds for all the stuff that I gave you at the start. You know, so you're putting people into desperate into a desperate situation where the only way they can they can probably um, you know, uh, survive and pay that debt is to go out and commit crime to do so. So the whole thing is a self-perpetuating, horrible, messy, um, you know, shitstorm of of um, stupidity as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, no, the thing, the bit, just to clarify, the bit, the bits that I just didn't agree with around what Neil was saying was, was more about he seemed to be laying the blame for the disproportionality issue around black people at the door of the police saying that it's because the whole of the police from top to bottom and the whole of the criminal justice system is systemically racist i totally disagree with that okay so can, can i ask can i pop some observations at you about legalizing drugs mm -hmm. then uh, from someone who thinks otherwise uh, uh, also a former police officer, okay? Uh, so um, even if uh, drugs were legal, and I'm saying this pretty much verbatim, even if drugs were legal, there would still be an illegal drug trade in it 1 million percent. Uh, it would not eradicate the illegal drug trade. Um, there's a whole host of people who would not want to be on record for going and buying drugs mm -hmm. because of jobs, family, life positions, etc. They like the anonymity of the illegal drug trade. Yeah, no, I think I think there's something in that. There's something in that. So your middle class recreational user, or you're a freak. You know, there is there is this kind of misnomer I think with drugs is that you know people think about drug, people think about the users of drugs as these sort of like, you know, seven stone spotty pill 
um, person shivering in a in a shivering in a bed sit or on the door of, of W. H. Smith. You know, y yes, a lot of you know people whenever they get to the lowest ebb, that's what a drug addict looks like. But an awful lot of drugs are consumed by people who who do not fit that stereotype. Who are who are man who are going out and doing a job. They are controlling their drug use they are they are function functioning high functioning drug users uh, equally the recreational user will will be buying cocaine um at the weekend or whatever um on a sort of a regular but a regular way but are probably not in the category of being addicts so, so i think um i think those are the probably the, the sort of people that you're you're sort of that person is talking about but what i what i think what i think um we we need to do is to um i mean I'm, i can't sit here i can't sit here and give a percentage i mean how, what percentage of people are fun high functioning drug users and what percentage are drug addicts but i know enough about policing from my 30 years experience of being in police cell blocks um you know on a weekly and well maybe not in my latter part of my career but certainly well no i was in cell blocks on a weekly basis because i was reviewing prisoners for extension of detention and things like that they are just chock full of drug addicts and and that is that that is um a huge drain on the economy uh it's a it's a human disaster how would that change if you legalize drugs I'm, I'm asking you the question as a devil's so, advocate. So, I'm, so I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we should be having drug shops. You know, I think it needs to be controlled. It needs to be treated as an illness, in the same way that, in the same way that, if I uh, have a um, a dodgy knee, which I've got at the moment, or a um, a mental health issue, or whatever, you go and see a medical practitioner. You get an assessment, and and then you go on some sort of a treatment program for that where part of that treatment program is the prescribing of whatever it is you need to uh, and that take it takes you away from from those horrible drug dealers who are continually pushing more and more and more using violence and intimidation against each other and all of that kind of stuff so i do think that person is right it's not going to eradicate it but it's going to significantly take money away from organized crime Agree, and I think over time it would it would uh, almost mi minimise it. So, you know, if you think about the situation where you go, you've got an immediate, you think of it on a practical level, right? So, you got, let's say tomorrow the drug the drug policy is reformed, and all of a sudden, I don't know, heroin was legal, right? And you mm. could and a and a, a drug addict who gets their heroin from a drug dealer today, tomorrow could go to a clinic, a GP, <clears throat> and get prescribed heroin mm. of a certain dose. Um, that heroin would be the quality of it would be guaranteed in, mm. and I, when I mean guaranteed, I mean oh great high quality, it's good gear. I don't mean that. I mean yeah, yeah. There's it's, no other. It's not going to be cut with exactly rat poison, rat poison mm. and all, all that shit, right? So their risk of death is less, and they're going to be get, given it by someone who cares about their health mm. and wants to wean them off it. So mm. they've got a choice between going to the GP and getting it. GP is an example. I've got a choice between going between, of going back to their drug dealer. Now on that practical level. That presents issues for people who are, who are existing as addicts now, mm. because they're already under the spell of the of the dealer they get it from. Mm. They're, the dealer already has control over them through violence, through intimidation, all the rest of it. And probably, those people aren't going to straight away and go, "Yeah, I'm going to go to the GP now for my for my gear from from here on in." Mm. So that that situation. That would have to peter out over time. Yeah. But certainly the onboarding of new addicts into mm. the system, someone mm. who isn't an addict today but could be an addict tomorrow, would almost certainly fucking die out. Because one, why would they go and pay a dealer for heroin when mm. um, uh, when they could get it for free from the GP? And two, the GP is not to give it to them. They haven't, because they're not an addict yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. there's going to be less dealers around because the market is less. There will simply be less people looking to go and get their drugs illegally, mm. which means the appeal of being a drug dealer or the drug trade is less, and there's less money in it, so they have less power. I like. I see how it works. I yeah, do yeah. see how it works. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. you made the point earlier, a really good point, about you You couldn't do a pilot somewhere. It would have to be UK-wide, because if you did a... Mm. One of the reasons is if you did a pilot, the pilot would be compromised by mm. drug the drug trade mm. trying to 
skew the results yeah. of that pilot. They yeah. wouldn't want it to be a success. No, of course not. It would be, uh, you know, your county lines, it'd be, yeah, it'd be yeah. pilot lines. Yeah. So they'd be trying to get the trucks. But like in. so many other things, unfortunately, um, so many of these decisions are made by politicians <laughs> who are who are clueless, who, who don't, who've never, who've got very little um, experience of, of these things. Um, the tabloid press, um, the right, the right leaning tabloid press, the Daily Mails and the, you know, they, th there's no votes, there's no votes in um, appearing to be soft on drugs, you know, it's, they're playing to, you know, you, you look, you think I don't want to get good, good eye in the rabbit hole of, you know, the Tory party over the last, you know, the car crash that's been the Tory party over the last few years, you know, but you look, you think, look at the people who put Liz Truss into number 10. How many people, 100 odd thousand, overwhelmingly white middle class. You mean the Conservative members? As, yeah, as Alistair Campbell and his podcast likes to describe them, the golf club bores. You know, these are the people who the Daily Mail and papers like that and the media are appealing to because they know that they need to, they need the backing of those people to keep the Tories in power. And um, so there will never be, under this government anyway, there will never be a, um, a policy that does the things that we've been describing because that will be, that is not something that you're home counties dwelling member of the Tory party um, will ever see as, as having any value. It's not, it's just not a vote winner. Hmm. Well, I hope that changes. Maybe it will change. I don't know. I don't know. There's certainly some, there's certainly some seismic shifts, shifts going to come into politics over the next few years. Seismic shifts. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I don't mind saying for the very first time, I mean, I don't want to get, to get all political about this. I don't, I'm not, I've never been a political person. Um, uh, but I have seen with my own eyes the terrible damage that this government have caused to the public sector in the UK. Um, they have adopted a, you know, it's that sort of classic neoliberalist um, policy of um, undermining public sector organizations then complaining that they're not doing a very good job in order to lay the groundwork to sell off the most profitable bits to their mates uh, and we've seen that I've seen that across many parts of the criminal justice system the whole criminal justice system now is in a, is in a grind effect grinding to a complete standstill um, you look at some of the horrible um issues there recently within probation system we've seen a couple of cases remember that guy who the guy who killed his par pregnant partner and the three children at the house in derbyshire there that came to court recently he was he'd just been released from prison um very very dangerous after guy. how many years i can't don't know how long he was in prison for but um again uh, the probation service um, made some mistake, <coughs> made some mistakes, classified as medium risk. We should all day long. He should have been classified as high, as high risk. Uh, there was another case where the probation, the probation service and I've been blamed for a similar case where a guy killed, I think, um, one, possibly two people, I'm not sure. Um, but again, this, th these are the results of those, um, parts of the public sector being completely undermined by cost cutting and an austerity program that has been that has decimated public services in the UK. And, and, and we're now seeing the results. These things don't happen overnight. You know, the, the results of, of, of undermining these organizations take time to work their way through. And we're now seeing, well, we've talked all about it, haven't we, about what's happened to policing. All of the stuff, pretty much all of the stuff that's happened to policing and is going on with policing. You can you can track that back to 2010 when the Cameron Osborne austerity program took the legs from underneath a lot of these organizations, aided and abetted by the lovely Theresa May. Mm. 
Worrying, depressing, not good at all. And it doesn't look like it's going to be any quick, quick fix anytime soon. Um, I know that you've got your finger on the, the, the technology pulse in, in, in a lot of areas. And quite often, I think, especially with the NHS, especially with the police, especially with any organization where, or industry where, like, resource strapped, for whatever reason, with the military as well, in some ways, they always seem to be like a step behind in taking advantage of current technologies um, to, in order to run leaner, be more efficient yeah. and take some of the, the pressure off. So <clears throat> can you talk about what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because um, you're working on some stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm one of the four co-founders of a tech startup. Um, we've, we've been on a, on a bit of a journey for the last 18 months building a set of capabilities um, for law enforcement. So to sort of explain what that's all about, um, exactly as you just described there, policing has been very late to the party in terms of taking advantage of the most sort of innovative technology, um, excuse me, to, to deal with um, uh, investigating crime. So, so with crime now, I think the stats are something like 94 Five percent of all crime now has some element of uh, digital evidence. Um, so that could be something as simple as a piece of CCTV. Um, could be a, a ring doorbell footage. It could be um, social media content, um, all the way through to the most complex crimes, uh, which were you know carried out by cyber criminals on the other side of the world. So everything from the most relatively simple case where someone rings up and says, my ex-partner is threatening me, um, some of those threats are gonna be on WhatsApp messages or they're gonna be on you know, TikTok or whatever, um, as well as face-to-face. -face. Um, so what we've done is we've built, we've built a capability to investigate crime involving any type of technology. So we can ingest data from uh, electronic devices such as mobile phones, laptops, computers, etc. We can ingest data that's already been um, acquired lawfully um, from say mobile phone uh, records, um, you know, IP downloads from Wi-Fi routers, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we can go to the internet, we can go to the open web, we can go to the dark web, and we can capture evidence, whether that's um, text or video, um, and we can package it all up into a nice evidential product that tells a story. Um, uh, and uh, everything is, uh, in, everything, everything's a, brought in, it's all indexed, um, the sort of raw HTML, whether it's raw HTML from the internet or whether it's downloads from a mobile phone, everything's uh, encrypted and indexed to make it searchable. Um, so if I'm working on an investigation in London um, into a drug trafficker, keep it topical, and I've acquired that drug trafficker's um, mobile phone communications, um, might be automatic number plate reading uh, movements from their car, there might be a load of um, uh, internet, uh, social media um, activity. Um, so I've sort of been capturing their um, uh, Snapchat accounts and all of that kind of stuff. And you are an investigator in Manchester, also investigating a different drug gang. If we're if we're using if you are using our technology, and I'm using the same technology, when you start investigating the same person, the system will say will flag up and say, um, uh, a colleague in London is also looking at this vehicle or a colleague in London has also got an interest in that mobile phone number. So it'll it'll do all of that auto it'll automatically give you the alerts to say, um, this is this is not just your narrow investigation. This is a much so in terms of giving you could give it to say, 
regional organised crime units, ROKUs, and if they were all using it, um, it doesn't matter where you are in the country or the world for that matter, um, you'll be able to, everybody can do their investigations from start to end and also be able to acquire, ingest data from other parts of the country or other systems. Also, it'll talk to some, sounds as if I'm giving you a massive sales pitch here, don't I? But I'm just explaining what it does. Well, sorry, one sec. So, how, so in that, right now, as the, as the systems work now, how, if I'm investing in getting a crime and across the other side of the UK, the one of the key protagonists in the investigation of that crime is being investigated for something else there, but it's linked. So it's intelligence that, mm. or it's information that could be intelligence to me to help my investigation. Mm. How do I know that now? How did how do officers come to know about you it? You probably wouldn't, you know. You, you, Unless you, it was just by coincidence would, to find out. You might get lucky. You might get lucky. And um, that, that, <coughs> per, that person um, could be flagged on an intelligence system so that um, it's probably... It pro it's probably more effective in a within the closed ecosystem of something like the counterterrorism world, where they're all kind of working generally to the same sort of um, standards and they're using the same systems all over the country. In the, in the counterterrorism world, it would definitely you would definitely find out. Um, in the in the organised crime world, the regional organised crime world, and the National Crime Agency. There's probably a pretty good chance you would you would you would know the, because the systems they'd be working on would be able to deconflict, um, um, in order to prevent that kind of blue on blue kind of activity. The problem comes when you're when you're dealing with the sort of the volume crime or the or the crime that sort of stands alone a little bit. So like a homicide investigation, you have a homicide that just springs up from kind of nowhere. And it's been looked at within a small geographical area, and they're probably not really talking to anybody else. So, one of the big challenges for law enforcement, and we've talked about already with David Carrick, isn't it? Is information sharing, being aware of what else is going on around the country, around you know uh, the police network. Um, this system, ideal world, is if everyone was using this system to investigate crime. Uh, it you just would never have that because it would automatically tell you. It'd say the phone number that you've ju that you're researching has already been looked at by DC Smith at um, you know the Southeastern Regional Organised Crime Unit. The, how does the sorry if you how does the information find its way onto the system? So does this like would this system require any extra manual entry by? Is does it create any extra work? By officers who in which no no because because it's got an API which sorry for those non techies out there it's an API is basically a, a means of connecting one system to another electronic system so you you could you could connect the system via an API into any um, local systems or any national systems if you have the authority you can't just plug any old thing into a national system you'd have to go through layers and layers of authorities and permissions to do that but theoretically if you were able to plug it into the police national computer for example and the police national database so as so i get i get my new investigation okay so i'm sat here i get my new investigation about this person about hugh Kerr. i don't know anything about hugh Kerr. he's a legend all. he's a legend <laughs> <laughs> he's probably innocent <laughs> it'll automatically go out and search all of those other systems and bring back and say right this is what we know about hugh Kerr already which saves you shit loads of time interrogating all of the systems um so yeah it's but the problem with technology and you'd mentioned the national health service and you mentioned the military and everything and, and all these public sector organizations are exactly the same in that it's very hard for people like us who are even though we are we've got loads of credibility within policing um the the, the way the way that the way that technology is procured in the UK is incredibly inefficient um, Go on. because the, the way the police service in England and Wales is organised is that we've got 43 separate forces, all of whom have got their own individual procurement teams, 
all of whom have got their own individual IT departments, um, <coughs> their individual budgets, um, all their finances are, are, are different. So trying to sell once into policing is impossible. You have to, you have to deal with all 43 forces. You also have to deal with each individual regional organised crime unit. You probably then have to deal with the National Crime Agency. You need to go to Police Scotland, Police Service of Northern Ireland. It's it's a slog. It's a real slog. Um, so you might have the best technology in the world uh, that has the best value proposition ever, but um, trying to navigate that very messy um, landscape is tricky. Rather you than me. Rather you than me. It sounds really interesting. And uh, I mean, one of the main things I can see it, the benefit of is, is the obvious one is a, a faster resolution time investigations because you've got more information at your fingertips faster, right? Which mm -hmm. means you can either close the case because they're innocent or, or, or get reach a conviction. And if, mm -hmm. if something's getting res resolved faster, it usually means it's used up less less um, resources along the way obviously yeah 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 i think um i think uh, the, the challenges around digital evidence are, are huge at the moment and the, the current the current ways that police officers are having to try and gather that evidence are very inefficient very time consuming so this will accelerate the whole pro process it'll also make it a lot more um evidentially you know when you take that package you pack you package the end result up and, and bring it to a court um, you can see exactly where everything's come from, every single piece of evidence that's come in there, every keystroke literally that you've done from start to end is all audited for integ integrity. So it's not a case of you turning up at court and pulling a rabbit out of a hat and say, oh, look what I've got. You say, well, where did you get that? And you think, oh, I'm not quite sure actually. Like, you know, was it'll, it'll audit absolutely everything. So when you go to court, if anything gets challenged at court and say, well, where did you get that? When did you do that? Who did that? You can, it tells you that story. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So um, if you're out there at the moment, you might buy a really great piece of investigative technology. Then. Oh, is it, is it ready know. to go now, is it? Yeah, it's all market ready, yeah. So we just got, we've just agreed, I can't say where from, but um, we've just had investment uh, in the last week, actually. So we've, we've had um, finally got the approval from investors to give us some money, um, which will, because at the moment, you know, there's four of us, we've all been working for 18 months now, and none of us have earned a penny from it. Um, but that's the thing about startups, isn't it? You've got to, you've got to put the, I think they call it sweat equity, isn't it? You've got to put the, you've got to put the effort in, in the belief that eventually it'll be worth it in the end. But 18 months on, it's hard, really hard, whenever you're putting a lot of work in and you're not getting paid. But you know, I think if you believe fundamentally, I think if you believe it's the right thing to do, then, um, uh, then yeah, it's worth doing. Yeah, that sounds good, man. Look at how, do, how, do, can, how can people keep a handle on that? Or just is the best way through well, you and the podcast? Well, it's, it's the, the technology is called Aquila Intelligent Solutions and the product's called Aquila Digital, A-Q-U-I-L-A, Aquila Digital. And um, yeah, we've got a lot of interest um, quite quickly, actually. Um, we're partnering with Microsoft. Have got us on their fast track um, partner program. Um, the uh, we're partnering with one or two other companies who are massively well respected, and they've seen the technology. They absolutely love it. I think. I mean, it was described by one company who are the kind of one of the leading. A company called Blue Lights Digital. They're one of the leading digital investigation training companies in the UK. When they saw it. Um, they described it as the best thing they've ever seen. So, uh, so yeah, uh, it's really exciting times. But um, you know, anyone out there who's who's worked in startup world knows that it's uh, it's it's a bit of a minefield. You know, there's so so many things that can go wrong. You know. Yeah, that sounds good, mate. Um, <clears throat> before we finish off, podcast Tango Juliet 
Tiger Foxtrot, Jeter, Foxtrot podcast. Set, yeah. You're on episode 75 next? 75 will be the next episode, yeah. That is rapid. You're moving at a faster <laughs> pace than I am. <laughs> Jesus, you need to call me up. Um, well, I've, I've actually calmed myself down a bit. I was churning out one one episode a week, which is which you know is too much. You know, trying to trying to tee up guests, trying to make it happen, get it out there once a week is is a lot, isn't it? So I'm I'm kind of more about every ten days. I now. thought you must have been going faster than that, because seventy five. Th- when did you start it? Uh, about eighteen months ago. Oh, I thought it was a year ago. Okay, no, right, yeah, well, that's no, right, yeah. no, 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 <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. I try and team up whenever I've got space. I tr- minimum one, once a week. I try and aim for. Late last year, I really fell off the fell off the. That pace was not kept up, but I feel your pain, mate. Yeah, it's a great podcast. Like I said, I was listening to the um, I was listening to the Alfie Moore episode earlier. Yeah, he's good, isn't uh, he? Yeah, that was good. Um, I haven't finished it yet, but uh, that's that is good. I was laughing I was right at the start. I was laughing. I was laughing. What, what was it? I won't give it away. There was a story. There's some. There's some anecdote. He's spun. I was laughing. I was laughing out loud, lolling. But um, no, mate, it's good. Keep it going. You know that's graft as well, because uh, that can often be a thankless task. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, I mean, I've learned a lot from doing it. I've really enjoyed doing it, and um, it's a real one of those real. If, at the risk of sounding cheesy, it's a real life affirming thing. You know, you get to, you get to meet and talk to some great people who've got some great stories to tell, and. You know, and and some of it's funny, a lot of it's funny, some of it's sad. You know, it's proper real life stuff. You know, people have done some pretty amazing things. You know, and and are 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 basically unknown, unknown. You know, so I think well, the least I can do is to kind of the police get so much shit, don't they? Um, and I, what I want to do, part of what part of the reason why I'm doing this, part of the reason why I wrote the book was to, to show the flip side of that, to say, hold on here, hold on. You're talking about, you know, t- tens of thousands of good men and women all over the country who are doing a fucking thankless job, um, doing crappy hours, working night duty, going out in the cold and the rain, uh, dealing with some very dangerous people um, and dealing with a lot of shit. They get absolutely no... You know, there's no balance in the reporting of policing. It's all just bad news story after bad news story, many of which are, you know, the David Carrick thing are appalling, and I'd be the first to say, you know, I just, it's shameful, the organisation, it's shameful that, that they've let that happen. I don't know how, but they have. But if I can kind of help people understand the, the real nature of policing and the real people who do it, and do it really bloody well, you know, then I think I've succeeded. So how do people find your book and how do people find your podcast? So you'll find the book, Tango Juliet Foxtrot, on, on Amazon, usual place, places. Uh, there's also an audio version of the book on Amazon now on Audible. Did you? Oh, which I did myself. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> never, never again am I going to do that. Why? What was the it's problem? It took four ages. It took so long. How long are we talking? Days? Oh, God. Weeks. Well, you wrote it. Oh, I know. You but should have done less but words, more getting, pictures. Getting the, getting the consistent tone, mm. fluffing lines, and and the, the number of times I recorded myself going, "Oh, for fuck's sake!" <laughs> <laughs> Did you record it at home? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then you you have to you have to get each file, each each chapter as an individual MP3 file. And then that then has to be tweaked and cleaned up in a piece of software um, to, to get it all absolutely perfect. Yeah. And then when they upload an Audible, then um, it gets uploaded to Audible. They do their own checking and making sure all the sound levels are all perfect and everything. So, yeah, but if you don't want to read it, listen to it. And if you want to listen to it for free... Ooh, <laughs> controversial. <laughs> I know. I actually put the files, each interval file on the podcast as well. Oh, have you? Yeah. What, as episodes? Yeah, as episodes, yeah. Oh, that's good. So if you want to listen to it for free, um, the only problem with that is it can be a bit of a ball ache to have to keep on. You know, if you read an Audible, if you're listening to an Audible book and you just stop and you come back to it, it'll start exactly where you left off. A podcast do that too. Most apps do. 
Well, yes, but each individual chapter is a different episode, isn't it? So you might have to find, I mean, it's not a big deal, is it? But you'll have to like search and find, all oh, right, which chapter is it now? Because the, because the chapters on the podcast are all mixed in with podcast episodes. Oh, I see. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. so I if you, drama. so if you want, if you want the seamless experience of listening to it in a oneer, spend a few quid on Audible. But if you don't mind backwards and forwardsing a bit and searching through the podcast episodes, then that's your, that's the solution I'd suggest. Mm. Great. It's been a pleasure. Really it's, enjoyed yeah, it. No, really I've enjoyed it. Every I've time. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it as well. Yeah, it's good. 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 Uh, thanks for time. I know you're gonna you got to shoot off now. I'm gonna get and, bloody uh, demonstrators outside my house with placards now, aren't I? Well, I haven't published your address yet. <laughs> Give me time. <laughs> <laughs> Getting trolled. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. Um, good luck with Aquila. Thank you. And uh, and good luck with the podcast, mate. Yeah. Thanks, mate. It's been a pleasure. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about five, ten minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Hey Chower, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.